if you would go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 1, where Rhonda just read for us, as that's where we'll begin our time in the Word today. Uh, and if you are new to us or not, uh, not familiar with what we've been preaching the last eight weeks, we are doing a series on spiritual gifts, and we are landing the plane. We are coming close to the end, and um, we are going to continue to see what God's purpose is for us in the giving of spiritual gifts. Uh, and as we do that, I just I want to share a little bit uh, about me. Some of you may or may not know this, um, but I am a food connoisseur, okay? I eat food several times a day. <laughs> and sometimes that includes things like second breakfast and 11 Z's. Um, amen. Uh, but the reality is, uh, growing up, that was not always the case. I mean, I ate multiple times a day, but I was not a connoisseur. I was limited. I was ignorant. Um, I was familiar with three basic spice groups growing up. Okay, some of you might be familiar with these. Salt, pepper, more salt. <laughs> go Pokes. I don't know. I'm doing this. That's for my cowboys this morning. Uh, Ricky Fowler, let's go. Um, but yeah, so as... As a child, I was, I was very limited. I loved the foods we ate, but uh, both sides of my family were like poor farmers, so um, meat, potatoes, great stuff. Um, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I actually became aware of things um, that uh, the rest of the world had been enjoying for centuries. Like, I didn't know what an avocado was, okay? Uh, I don't even know if I said that right. I don't even know if that's how you say avocado. I've been told I say this weird, and it doesn't matter. Uh, but I'd never had that. I waited tables at a college at Charleston's. It's the first time I think I'd ever seen an avocado or tasted an avocado. And um, it was only then that my palate began to mature or mature. I can't say things. I don't talk good all the time. Uh, and so it was during this uh, sort of renaissance in my mouth as the Lord began to introduce things to me that um, I met a young lady by the name of Erica. Uh, and when I met Erica, Erica was a barista at a Vietnamese deli on the south side uh, called Cafe Bella. It's no longer there. You might remember it from the jingles back in the day. Just a little boba tea and some bun me. Uh, that, that was not. They never did that. That's terrible. Uh, but uh, that's where she worked. And at some point, once I met her, I became attracted to her. And like all good, young, ignorant, uh, dumb boys, uh, I just showed up at her work because I wanted to see her. Now, she didn't know this. Uh, I just showed up one day to Cafe Bella because uh, I knew she was working, and that's what you do. And so I've never had Vietnamese food. I couldn't have told you anything that would have fallen into that category. Uh, and so she's, I don't remember her exact words, but she was polite and kind, and she's like, you know, what, what do you want? What would you like? I didn't know, and so I said, surprise me. Surprise me. Um, I didn't know then just how amazing uh, that choice would have been, because that could go really bad, right? You know, some people like surprises, some people don't. Um, but I asked her to surprise me, and she said, oh, I'll make you an avocado smoothie. <laughs> Outwardly, I was like, man, that's great. That sounds wonderful. Inside, I was like, what? Because uh, mind you, I had, remember, I I'd, I'd discovered avocado. I loved guacamole. No one says it like that either. I'm telling you, I don't have to say words all the time. But in my mind, there was a category for avocado, and that was savory. It was not shake. And I thought, okay. Um, and so I am proud to admit that in my ignorance of my ignorance, I was completely wrong. I want you to imagine this shake. It was as if a sugar cookie had been just delectively delivered to my taste buds. It it was, it was a weird experience because on one hand I was like, oh, this is really delicious, but my brain couldn't get over it as an avocado. But I continued to go back and ask for that because um, it was wonderful. And so it wasn't until I met Erica that my, my understanding of uh, food and taste, um, it, it took time. But it was through these experiences that my taste buds of discernment would be trained, okay, that they would grow to a point where I could joyfully experience the full gamut of global flavors and truly embrace the six taste qualities of sweet and sour, bitter, salty, umami, or savory, if you will. And last, but definitely not least, my favorite of the flavor categories, chocolate. Um, 
the reality is how we experience flavors uh, makes a difference, right? Like it, it affects how we experience the taste of our food, but how we experience the taste of our food goes well beyond just those five categories. All the other senses are brought into play, right? Your sense of smell, when you see your food, even the sense of hearing affects the experience. And if you don't believe me, just try this for a second. Cr- crackling bacon in a pan, okay? All right? Yeah. Grinding coffee beans or even the ruffle, something as simple as the ruffling of a bag of a potato chip, okay? They affect our flavors. And this is going to sound super silly, but in many ways, spiritual gifts work the same way. There is a beautiful design that God had by combining different gifts in an individual, and putting those individuals in a church, that there is a rhyme and reason behind why God distributed these gifts of grace to the body of Christ that it might enhance, I don't want to use this, but I don't know a better way, to enhance the flavor of our ministry, of our life together, the working of the church on display. And so going back to Ephesians 4, it even tells us why God did this. What would be the reason God would take all these different individuals, gift them differently with various combinations of gifts, and put them in a community together. And we see that it is for the glory of Christ, for the building up of the body. But there's one particular thing that it mentions in Ephesians 4, and it talks about that we would attain a unity of faith and a maturity in manhood. It takes, it, it takes this concept of maturing as, a, as an adult, and it says so that we wouldn't be lacking in anything. He's given these gifts to us that we might grow up into the fullness of the measure of Christ. That's a glorious reason why God gave spiritual gifts. And that is kind of the the focus of where we're going to go a little bit today is to see the need of this idea of maturity. And so um, if it is true, and we believe that's true because that's what the Bible says, then it's really important that just like it says here in 1 Corinthians 1, that this would be a desire we have. Let's read it again together. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians Let's read again what it says here, because this is going to be a kind of a catapult towards where we're going today. It says, this is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. I, want you to, I don't want you to forget everything we've talked about so far. This was a church that was full of chaos, right? We've already covered a lot of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14. But I want you to, a few chapters before that, I want you to think about this church. This is a church where people were dividing over silly things. They were boasting in who they had been baptized by and who they, were, who they were following. There were factions of Paul and Apollos or Christ. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. There's one. It's Christ. Not only that, we get further down the chapter and we see that like people were getting drunk taking communion. Okay? Like that's horrific. But Paul is having to address this. This is a church that's full of immaturity, but they're full of gifts. And we know that because he says, or he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that this very church that Paul is having to correct and encourage and And instruct in many different ways we see has all these gifts. And we see that this is a beautiful part of God's design for the church. And so if this was true of Corinth and all their chaos, let this not be and should this not be a desire of our own hearts that we would be a church that's not lacking in any gift. So if you're keeping track at home over the last eight weeks, some of you I know play the David Payne bingo card with all the storms. Well, if you've been doing that with spiritual gifts, you may have noticed that over the last eight weeks, we've actually covered every single gift that is mentioned in our four main passages. So Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and then the two passages, two sections of 1 Corinthians 12. If you've noticed, we've covered all the gifts. So why do we have two more weeks? Why do we have two more weeks of spiritual gifts? Shouldn't it just be, we're done? Aren't we over? Well, the reality is that there are other specific giftings mentioned in the Bible. And it kind of poses the question, well, if we've covered all the gifts in these lists, is that it? How many of you have heard there are other spiritual gifts? Or how many of you have heard of some of these other gifts that maybe we haven't covered so far? Like maybe hospitality. I know it's a very common one that gets mentioned. Or intercession. Well, we're going to look at some of those this morning. But it's a really important question for us. Because if it is vital to our health and maturity as a body of Christ. That we aren't lacking in any gift. That it's really important that we understand what all those gifts are. 
So some of the questions before us this morning, and this, this sermon is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to be unpacking gifts in the same way we have been and looking at characteristics, and we're not going to be defining them out and looking for different ways that you as an individual may be gifted in this because we're, we're kind of covering it from a different angle. But what we should be asking ourselves is that, are these the only passages that mention spiritual gifts? And if these are, is this an exhaustive list? Or are there other gifts not mentioned here, kind of like what I just referenced? So our focus today is going to be zooming into these questions. Are these it or are there others? And, and then ultimately, like, what does that even mean? How does that affect how we are living and applying this to live in light of these truths? Okay. So we're going to look at several texts. We're going to kind of fly through several passages where we see a reference to spiritual gifts. And we know that because that word gift in the Greek is going to be connected to the word charis, charisma. Okay, charismata, this idea of a spiritual gifting of grace that we see when it talks about spiritual gifts. And so the first one I'm going to look at is hospitality. It's found in 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11. This is what it says. It says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, charis, charisma, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is kind of a, one of the next best passages where we see some gifts mentioned, and specifically we see hospitality. If you notice it comes before that passage where it kind of lists some of the gifts, but it tells us to show hospitality. And this is an instruction that really applies to all believers. We see this in other passages. But it's important to note, and the reason we're going to uh, mention it specifically is because it specifically kind of falls in connection with this idea of spiritual gifts. And I'll be honest, this was a gift that I've mentioned several times over the years when I think about gifts. It's always one that pops in my mind that I didn't really realize until the last years we were really studying. It doesn't fall in line with those lists of gifts in the other four passages. And something that you may have noticed, did you notice how each of those four lists don't all contain the same gifts? Have you noticed that? That Romans lists several, that maybe some of them are found in others, but the others don't list those. And actually, there's only one gift that's actually found in all four lists, and that's the gift of prophecy, uniquely enough. Um, but this is another passage where we see hospitality. And I don't know what you thought hospitality meant. This really uh, means being generous to guests. And so I think that's a general context that we've seen. This idea of hospitality centers around inviting people into your home to share a meal, to have fellowship, to have community. When we mentioned hospitality, uh, intercession was one that uh, is, is very common in our culture, something that is in the church. And we see this in Ephesians 6 when Paul says that you would pray at all times in the what? Spirit. So we see a direct connection to the Holy Spirit empowering someone to pray specifically. We also see this referenced in 1 Corinthians 14. And this, this idea here, we see this in Romans 8, we, we know the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, but is this a spiritual gift that some of us have as believers, that some of us are just uh, empowered and called and driven to intercede for those in need? We'll answer that later, but I want you to understand that this is connected to the Spirit. Another one. That's maybe not as common um, in the body of Christ, or at least in our culture, but is this potential gift of singleness. Singleness. Just turn to 1 Corinthians 7. This is a unique passage where Paul is addressing several things, but I want you to listen to Paul's instructions here. Um, it seems to tell us something about singleness or celibacy. Uh, Beginning in verse 7, listen to what he says. He says, I wish that all were as I myself am. Okay, so Paul himself is single. If you didn't know this, Paul was never married. And Paul is actually addressing principles for marriage, and he's talking about service unto the Lord. And he's giving some instructions to the church and how to engage both of those things. And he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. He says, but each has his own gift from God. Charisma. Same word that we use connected to the other spiritual gifts. He says, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one to another. To the unmarried and the widow, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And so in this whole passage, Paul does not condemn anything, but he gives some right divide for if you are married, your attention and things are focused, but he, he specifically references the idea of singleness as a gift. 
Now, I know there was a time in my life where I kept thinking, like, Lord, is this something? I didn't understand this was a potential gift, but I was like, I'm single for a long time. And I'm like, Lord, you're going to have to change my desire because I do not feel like this is a gift. If this was a gift, and it is a gift, that this is not a burden or a shackle. The thought of singleness is not complete, competing against a desire to be married, to have a family, to pursue those things, which is a right and good desire. And I think actually the norm, I think that's kind of what Paul even um, unpacks here, and we see that even connected back to Genesis, that there is a unique gifting to marriage. There's a specific reason why God has done that, but there is a unique calling that God does have for some of us to be single, and for some of you, that's true in this room, and I've, I've talked to some of you where you're like, you have no desire to get married, no desire for family, but you are committed to serving the Lord as you are, and I think Paul would say here, uh, because of the text, that that is a type of gift to be celebrated and to be enjoyed. Well, another one that's kind of obscure is further in 1 Corinthians. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, and I am moving through these rather quickly on purpose, um, but another gift that is connected to these passages is the gift of martyrdom. The gift of martyrdom, which is literally giving your life for the sake of the gospel, to literally lose your life for Christ's sake. And the reason that this comes up in these discussions is in 1 Corinthians 13, the very first few verses there, Paul is giving some exhortation. It's reminding them of the importance of love over and against these gifts. And I want you to see what he says here. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I have, if I give it all away, and if I deliver up my body to be burned... But have not love, I gain nothing. And so Paul actually includes this idea in the same verses where he mentions faith and prophecy and knowledge. We see that apart from love, none of those things mean anything. Um, But this is losing one's life for Christ's sake. And specifically in uh, relation to this, um, I feel like this is a type of gift that the Lord has given. We know many brothers and sisters throughout the world that are suffering and are giving their lives. And I don't know if you've ever spent any amount of time, this is kind of a side note, but I think in light of this, if you've never read Fox's Book of the Martyrs, I want to encourage you to check it. It's a classical piece. It was written by John Fox many centuries ago, and it's really an account of those who have given their lives for Christ. And if you want something to stir you and make you weep and celebrate all at the same time, uh, it is a really wonderful book to invest in. And there's one story connected to that that I just want to share Look up the story of Thomas Hogg. This is an individual that was taken. This is the mid-1500s in England. He was arrested, and they were trying to get him to recount his faith, to recant and dismiss the gospel, and he refused. And he was going to be burned at the stake. And as they were doing that, he had friends that were allowed to come visit him, and they were pleading with him, and they were asking him, hey, if the Lord can sustain you, will you give a sign for us to know that you're okay? Will you let us know that the Lord is helping you and enabling you to bear the weight of your suffering? And they basically had this agreement that if that were the case, that he would give a sign by, by clapping, by acknowledging this. And so as it went, they get to the day of execution. They take him. He, uh, they put a chain around his waist. He's tied to a stake, and they, they light the flames. And very quickly, he, his body was consumed. And I've read multiple accounts of this um, from different sources. And it seemed to be that he very quickly... Um, was given up to death. And after a long period of time, as he's there and the flames have engulfed him completely, out of nowhere, Brother Thomas lifts his hands up above his head and claps three times and gives a shout to testify to his brothers and sisters that our God is faithful and I can endure it because he is with me. That is a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Whether it's a spiritual gift or not, that should stir us as brothers and sisters to know that God is with his people. Well, a couple of others that are worth mentioning because they find themselves in Scripture being connected to spirit empowerment. One particular, and both of these are found in the Old Testament. One is also mentioned kind of in the New Testament. But it's this idea of craftsmanship. This idea of craftsmanship. Uh, Exodus 35, as God is giving instructions for the building of different things with the temple and the tent of meeting, I want you to listen to these words that are recorded in relation to a gentleman. Um, Again, I'll probably mispronounce his name. But a gentleman uh, named Bezalel. And it says, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, 
with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach. Both him and Oholiab, the son of Ahisamak of the tribe of Dan, he has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine uh, twined linen or by weaving by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So even in the Old Testament, we see these moments where the Holy Spirit is coming upon people and empowering them right here for the work of trade. Like, if you, I don't know how you feel, but like, it's encouraging to me when I can see there's examples of the Lord empowering people to do things that don't seem super spiritual. Like, you may never, never thought of using a tile saw or sewing a piece of clothing as something that the Lord can empower you to do. But the Lord did it in the scripture. And so it's something that we need to think about when we think about what are spiritual gifts and are these things as a body that we should be including in our list. The last one is, and something that's very common is music. Spiritual gift or not, we all know, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that the Lord is definitely using in the spirit of grace. We are blessed with that in our body here. And we see that First Chronicles 25. We see the Lord seems to be moving through the use of musicians, excellent and skilled to the point where the glory of God is filling the temple. But then specifically also in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, in the same chapters where, where gifts are mentioned, it even talks about how when you come together, some of you have, and it talks about a teaching, a revelation, a word, and it actually includes the word hymn. Uh, in the Greek, it's actually solos. Solos actually uh, connects to songs, and that actually means to pluck a string um, it means some other things, but it's very much musical related, and it seems to be connected to other giftings the Lord is giving the body of Christ when they come together. And so that's it for our list. We could mention some others, but these are the most uh, primary that connect to spiritual gifts, and it's important for us as we ask these questions about spiritual gifts, are these gifts exhaustive? Are these it, or are there other gifts that we need to include? Um, and I think it's important because on one hand, we can we don't want to be closed where the Bible is open, right? We hold to the sufficiency of Scripture. We don't want to cut off things that the Lord speaks to, but at the same time, we don't want to open it up and be loose with our text and open it up for just anything and everything so that something as menial as brushing your teeth becomes a spiritual gift. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think I'm safe to say that's not a gift in any way, shape, or form. Um, but in light of that, I, I want us to remember what, what is our definition of spiritual gifts? What is the definition that we've laid out that we are rooted in as we think about spiritual gifts? So I want, I want to put it back up on the screen if it's not already. And I just want to remind ourselves, when we think about spiritual gifts, that these are various abilities that God, by his grace, is giving to believers in order to minister to others with a heightened effectiveness that is empowered by, and in fact, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of building up the church. So let's answer the question, are the lists in our forming passages, is that it? Is this an exhaustive list? And the stance that we're going to take here at the well is that that answer is no. We don't see them as an exhaustive list because we recognize that a good case can actually be made that some of these other gifts are under the umbrella of this definition. We can see people utilizing their trade or even music. We see people moved with hospitality that just seem to, there just seems to be a, a different way that they invite people in. Like there's this, I, you know, music, these different things. And so we think that there's a case that can be made scripturally, but at the same time, we are not going to definitive, we're not going to definitely define them as such. So it's rather than going either or, we're, we're taking kind of a middle ground because on one hand, we do see that a case can be made. We see this idea of the charisma, this, these gifts of grace being connected to some of these things. But at the same time, because they don't fall in line with these other lists, we don't want to make a blanket statement and say these are definitively gifts of the Spirit. But we are open to saying that, yes, the Lord can move, can empower people, can give an ability in these different areas for these very things that bring him glory, that bear fruit in the church. So if that's the case, great, amen. Let's close the book and move on, right? No. What does this mean for us? If that's true, then how are we to think about these things that we just talked about? How are we to think about the one another's? Because as we've already talked about, many of these gifts, even though they are gifts that are given to the body, they're also instructions that are given to every believer. Like just because there is a gift of generosity, there are some of us that are gifted supernaturally with giving, 
does not excuse the rest of us from still giving joyfully and generously and sacrificially to the body and work of ministry, right? Just because there are those who are gifted with acts of mercy and compassion that are uniquely equipped by the Spirit to step into really hard, broken things and engage people with compassion in a way that invites them to the goodness of God and invites them into the body of Christ to be ministered to, that doesn't mean the rest of us go, hey, you've got that. Because there's still an instruction and a command from the Lord to step into ministry. And so, as we think about gifts, whether they are natural or supernatural, I think the ultimate question with all of this is whether or not we are engaging our lives and our world in the power of the Spirit. Because at the end of the day, whether these are supernatural spiritual gifts or these are things that we're just maybe crafted in God's design of you as an individual and it's just maybe more of a natural affinity, a natural talent that you have, are you living a spirit-dependent life? Because at the end of the day, all of life is flowing through that. So our main point today is we kind of distill all of this down of what I want to spend the last bit of our time kind of unpacking and thinking through in light of all the gifts, but then even maybe these other peripheral things that could be gifts, is that whether they are natural or supernatural gifts, every area of our lives requires a dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, is that true for you? Are you living a life that's spirit-driven, that's spirit-dependent, spirit-reliant? As you think about the ways that God has given you gifts to engage the lost, to engage the body of Christ? Are you living in such a way that is submitted to and yielding to and trusting in the Spirit to enable you to do those things? I heard Paul Washer say one time, you can't even tie your shoes apart from the power of the Spirit. I think in contrast to some of the more weightier things of ministry and life, are we doing that? Are we living a life that's dependent? Because if we are attempting to do this Apart from the Spirit, we are not going to be able to live and bear the fruit we are called to live. And so are you attempting to do that? That is kind of the question before us. Is, are you attempting to, to live your life apart from the power of the Spirit? Are you approaching your marriage in your own strength? Your relationships? Is your approach to parenting disconnected from your need of the Holy Spirit's grace to empower you to do that well? At your job, are you seeing, regardless of how you're gifted and wired, are you looking to the Holy Spirit to help you do your work in such a way that it bears fruit and brings glory to the Lord? Not even in action, just in contentment. Are you satisfied? Are you looking to be satisfied with the way God has gifted you and designed you and the power of the Spirit? Or are you looking to yourself? I feel like the, the admonition that Paul gives the Galatians, what began in the spirit are you now trying to protect, per, perfect in the flesh? Because if that's true, if you think through, am I looking to the spirit? Am I relying on him? Or, or if I were to be honest, is it really just me? Then today's a day of repentance. The invitation we had this morning is the same invitation we have in relation to our gifts and our design, that we are to run to the one who can forgive and fill us with power from on high. And this is actually what it means. I, I love football. I love my sports. I even love a little Tim Tebow, but Philippians 4.13 does not mean what it thinks we mean. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that's in the context of contentment, of suffering, of trial of living a life in the power of the Spirit, when everything else around us, everything in culture, you are going against the grain. You, Paul is imprisoned here, being stripped of so many of the, the, the comforts and leisures of the world. And when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, this is the very thing he's talking about, because apart from the Spirit, he couldn't do any of it. Even Jesus himself did not do his ministry apart from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Yes, there is a distinction between Jesus and us. We are not the God-man. But Jesus, as the perfect son of man, lived his life in the power of the Spirit as a model and example for the rest of his people to know that we can fulfill the work he's called us to do. 
Leading up to this series, I've been super excited. And over the last year, we've talked about this. This is something that's been in the work for a long time. And as I thought about this sermon and thinking about the rest of the gifts and just the reality of God gifting the church, there's been a constant stirring in my heart that the Lord would do something really powerful through this series. That we've been praying, we laid out a list of 18 prayers stepping in the series that God would be working in different ways, that our eyes would be lifted higher, that our, our thoughts, that there would be clarity and affirmation and then the utilization ultimately that we would be who God's called us to be. But in light of all those good godly desires and the prayers that we've been praying, I, I want to be really honest, and this is something that's been stirring in my heart this week, is that with that joyful desire and anticipation for the Lord to do something, there's also been a fear in my heart, a pastoral fear that as we are praying for more of the Spirit's power, that our eyes would be lifted higher, our hearts be drawn near, that three months down the road after the series, six months, a year or two down the road, that this series will have had zero impact on your life as an individual. Now, I don't mean ultimate fear. The Lord is working. But there is a genuine fear that we just finish this series next week. And we've checked the box of maybe some theological things in our mind that now I know what spiritual gifts are. I've grown in my knowledge. There's been an intellectual activity that's happened. But the practical outworking of how we live our lives, my fear is that for many of us, it's not going to change. Even, even... If you've been saying yes internally, yes and amen to much of what we've preached regarding spiritual gifts and the manifestation of the power and presence of the Spirit to build us up, to make us one, to make us effective for ministry, to push back darkness, to preach the gospel, that there is a reality that we can move down the road and this gets lost in the back the back of our minds because we're, we're just moving on to the next thing and we're not taking the time to really reflect and meditate and dive into what the Lord has. That we are not moved to seek the Spirit because you don't see or feel the weight of your need. The reality is, church, we live in a culture that's too self-dependent. I love my country, but we live in a country and we are surrounded by a culture that is repeatedly telling you, uh, you are enough. You're it. You're good. You're great. This is not a knock on anyone. I know that that connects to something, but I, I'm being serious. Like, we are constantly surrounded by a culture that wants to tell you you don't need anybody, you don't need anything, and anybody who is willing to step into your life and maybe push back on um, something you aren't doing well or to point out sin, we are being conditioned culturally to resist that, reject that, and to, to step into an echo chamber of people who just make us feel really good. And the reality is that's not helpful for us. That's not healthy as a church. And so there's two sides to this fear that I want to address this morning. And the first is the reality of those who are young in their faith. As you're stepping in to what the Lord is calling you to do, that there is, there is a, a, a right season to step into the elementary principles of truth. To not rush past the foundational truths of the gospel. Not because we graduate to something beyond the gospel later, but because apart from a strong foundation in the Bible, a strong foundation in the gospel, it is hard to build upon any other foundation because every other foundation is going to crumble. And so for some of you, in light of this fear, I want to encourage you to let your roots grow deep, to not move too quickly, but to, to study your word, to know Christ, to run to him, just like we talked about. It was mentioned this morning, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, this morning in prayer that how sweet is it after these three chapters of spiritual gifts that Paul says, I want to remind you of what's most important, of utmost importance, and that is the gospel and to run him. So I, I want you to encourage you to step into the word, to see your need to grow in the Lord and to mine for diamonds in the scripture. To dive for pearls in the ocean of God's character and to not despise the day of small things. To be honest with where you are and to start there and grow and pursue the Lord, that it will strengthen your foundation to build to a maturity in the faith so that you can then disciple others. The other side of this coin, this, this fear that I felt this morning, and I'll be honest, this, is a, this falls into a category of sort of pastoral fervency to give an exhortation this morning to you. And that is that 
for some of you, there's an invitation this morning to step out of the infancy of your faith and to pursue the Lord with a vigor that the Spirit provides. I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 5 for a moment. I have some encouraging words from the Lord, but I, I want to address this because I think, I think this is important for our body. Because if we're talking about gifts, and we're talking about building up in maturity, and if we go back, the reality is if we are lacking gifts in the body, then we are going to be hindered in our maturity as a body. I want you to listen to these words that Paul shares. I'm sorry, not Paul. I was in Corinthians. We don't know who the writer of Hebrews is. I actually don't think it was Paul, but that's debatable. It's irrelevant. We know it's inspired. And the writer of Hebrews says this. He's been talking about different things. He's been talking about Christ, the high priest. He's been talking about deep things to a group of people that are looking back to Jesus plus something, okay? They're needing to be reminded again that it's by grace alone through faith alone, that we're not looking to the law, we're not looking to our activities, we're not looking to the list of do's and don'ts, but we need to return and see that Christ is the great high priest. He's fulfilled it all, and this is what he says. He says, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Oh, that we would be lacking in nothing. That we might grow in maturity, that we might fan the flame of the gifts that God has put in us to the glory of his name, to bear fruit in the spirit. And for that to happen, for some of us in this room, this is true. And I say this with a love as a pastor, but there are those of you who are gifted as leaders and teachers at the well that need to move on from milk to solid food. And to not hear the weight of law placed on you this morning, to do better, to run faster, to jump higher, but to run to Christ in the gospel, to rejoice that God has gifted you for the good of this body and that for us to be healthy, we need leaders. We need those of you who are teachers. We need some of you who are still on the elementary principles to move on to solid food, to disciple and raise up others who are young in the faith. This morning is an invitation to see that in all of the ways God has gifted us, we have an opportunity to be invited into the wonderful work of ministry. Where we are hindered is not because of a lack of the Lord. The Lord will continue to work and do His sovereign, gracious, salvific, redemptive work in the world. But the reality is He has ordained through the giving of spiritual gifts to local congregations that we do that in His name, in His power. So what I want to invite you to this morning, regardless of where you are in that, if that's true for you this morning, I don't want to just tell you what you should be doing. I want to invite us into the how. I want to invite you in to the how. Because it's not super complicated. If a doctor doesn't give you the proper diagnosis, it's unloving. And so as pastors, we want to shepherd you. We want to encourage you. But we also want to point out the reality is we need to mature in some areas. We need to mature in biblical literacy. We need to mature in spiritual gifts. And not just spiritual gifts, but all of life to see that we need him. Because if you're sitting there like me, like I see my own weaknesses in some of these things. I see areas where I need to mature. And so... If you're like me, you're often like, well, then how do I do this? What is it? I mean, that's great, Terrell. You're telling me. I, I get it. I feel it. I know that. I can see it. I want to tell you something very simple. Pray. Pray. Seek the Lord and pray. Because unless we are abiding in Jesus, we can't do anything. And Jesus tells us this. How often in the scriptures does God give an invitation to ask him for more of the Holy Spirit? He acknowledges our weakness, acknowledges what we can't do, and says, come to me, run to me. 
In John chapter 15, Jesus gives this wonderful example. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. He talks about being in the vine. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so how do we mature? How do we step into the, the deeper waters of our faith? How do we mature in our walk with Christ to move on to solid food? We have to seek him. We have to spend time with him. And he helps us in our weakness. If we are called to glorify the Lord and bear fruit, we do this in him. Piper says this about these passages. In John 15, he says, how then do we glorify him? Jesus gives the answer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So we pray. We ask God to do for us through Christ what we can't do for ourselves. And that is to bear fruit. The very fruit that we're talking about in spiritual gifts. John 15, 8 gives the result. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So how is God glorified by prayer? Have you ever thought about that? How is God glorified by you running to him and saying, I can't do it. I don't know how. I don't have the energy, the strength, the ability apart from you. Prayer is the open admission that without Christ, we can do nothing. And prayer is the turning away from ourselves to God and the confidence that he will provide the help that we need. So as the band comes up, we continue worshiping together as a body. I want to close with a couple truths that fit into this reality. In the midst of all of this, so I was thinking through the sermon and really feel like the Lord is calling us up and out. I, I want you to remember that the very same thing we said to start the service is still true in the midst of this. If you are there, if you feel the Lord's conviction that I, I am on milk still, by now I should have graduated to me. I need to be further along than you are. Like, there's still a truth that it's okay to not be okay. The gospel speaks to us where we are this morning, not with condemnation, but with the hope that even in the midst of that, we don't have to stay there. The gospel tells us good news that we don't have to stay there, that the Lord will grow and restore and that there is change. Right before those passages in John 15 and John 14, do you want to know what Jesus is telling his disciples? He is telling them that he's about to go. He says, but I'm not going to depart you. The helper is going to come. The paraclete. The Holy Spirit, two different occasions, he tells them twice. He says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. But the Holy Spirit is going to come. So the, the joy this morning is that the Lord will provide what he's requiring of us. The Lord equips us. And so if you are in here this morning, you're like, I don't know what my gifts are. Maybe I do, and I'm, I'm not walking in this then would you hear the invitation of Jesus Christ to say, come and abide in me. Beyond just spiritual gifts and all of life, in your parenting, in your marriage, you have to abide in him. As children seeking to obey their parents and give honor where honor is due, you need the Holy Spirit to obey your parents. Those of you who go to work, those of you who stay at home, those of you who are seeking to engage people in your gospel community that are hard for you to love, or maybe there's friction and, and, and struggle. And Hey, can we just acknowledge like relationships are hard? We've talked about this. If you think GC is simple and easy and you're going to get along with everybody, then you have the wrong expectation. Because every single one of us in this room have the ability to sin against another and be sinned against. And guess what? We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I need the Holy Spirit to empower me to engage other people when I have nothing left. I have no strength. Because this is part of his beautiful design for the church, that apart from him, we can't grow. But in him, we can bear much fruit. Paul thanked the Lord that in the midst of their immaturity, they were not lacking in any gift. And I think as a church, God has graciously given us these gifts. Supernatural, natural. We are a very gifted and blessed church in so many ways. We need to run to him to steward these well. That food illustration was silly, but it's true. 
that the ministry and the work of this church is uniquely enhanced by the unique reality of how God has shaped each and every one of us in Christ. The unique combination of your natural personality, your natural design, and the supernatural gifts that God has given you are so uniquely beautiful that our church is less without you. But as you step in, as you run to Christ, as you abide in him, this church is going to flourish. Because I don't want to look back a year from now and nothing has changed. I want to see the spirit moving in such a way that the kingdom continues to break loose in our city, in our church, in our families. That people would be saved and people would continue to grow to treasure Jesus is better. Because that's what it's about. It's about him. So on this Father's Day, as we close the sermon and move to worship, let's run to our Father. Because of Christ, run to your Heavenly Father. As C.S. Lewis wrote so beautifully in the last battle, the invitation today is to come further up, further in, and feast on the beauty, the satisfying reality that is Jesus Christ. Because in all of life, we must be dependent on him and praise God. He is willing, he is able, and he has promised to help us in our need. Let us run to him now. And let's see him bear much fruit in our body for his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. We are grateful for your goodness to us, Lord. We need you, Lord. And we ask right now, Lord, that you would do the work of ministry. Lord, that you would be moving in people's hearts and minds right now where people feel convicted, where people feel the weight maybe of their inadequacy or their failures, Lord. Would the gospel even now begin to remind them of the promises that your blood covered it all. There is no sin, there is no failure that the cross of Christ cannot cover, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that this morning. I pray that as our our prayer team is here at the front, and those in the back, Lord, if there's any here that need prayer that is debating to come up, Lord, would would you give them courage to come and receive prayer because you have ordained to minister in that way, Lord. As we worship, as we sing, as we turn our eyes to you, Lord Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do the work of ministry this morning. You would save, redeem, convict, restore, encourage, And give us a great confidence that as we abide in you, you are with us to empower us to do all the work you've called us to do. We need you and we look to you and we thank you in Jesus' name.